saw about a dozen guys standing on the sidewalk. Most of them were covered in tattoos. There are keys to approaching uh, a group like this. Number one, approach them with a white dog wearing sunglasses, which is kind of disarming. Make sure you've got an unusual accent. Also, approach them with a body that's about five foot five and absolutely no muscle mass whatsoever, so there's no threat to them. I told them I'd give them a gift card. I got three interviews, three colorful interviews, and afterwards, I went over and gave them all a, uh, an In-N-Out uh, burger gift card and one of those little cards that advertises uh, the YouTube channel. And they said they'd check them out. Uh, so I think I made about a dozen friends that day. I hope you enjoy these interviews. Lee, what's the biggest thing that's ever going to happen to you in your life? I'm going to hit the jackpot. Well, is there an afterlife? Yeah. Do you think about it much? All the time. Are you afraid of dying? Mm, right now, yeah. Everybody's afraid of dying. In fact, the Bible says that. It says, all our lifetime we are haunted with a fear of death. It takes our breath away to think that we could die and be buried in the dirt. You know, we love life. We love the blue sky and good food and friends and all these things. And to give it up because of this thing called death is fearful. The day you die is the biggest day of your life because that's when you're going to enter into eternity. That's the day you start living. Yeah, do you think there's an afterlife? Pretty sure. You believe in God's existence? Yep. Is he happy with you or mad at you? I gotta wait to talk to him. Do you know what the Bible says death is? No, what does it say there? Wages. It says the wages of sin is death. Have you ever heard that? Yep. And the gift of God is eternal life. Yeah. So God says death is payment from him. It's like a judge seeing a heinous criminal who's murdered three young girls after he raped them and he says, you have earned the death sentence. This is what you got due to you. It's your wages. And God says, you and I have earned death. Do you think you've earned death? Are you that bad that you should suffer capital punishment? No. You're a good person? Yeah, I believe so. How many lies have you told in your life? Countless. You ever stolen something? I have. So you're a lying thief? Yep. You still think you're a good person? Yeah. So you think a lying thief is a good person? I don't think a lying thief is a good person, but I'm a good person. You're a lying thief. My pa- hey, the, uh, it was a thief on the cross next to Jesus, wasn't it? My point. Are you doing anything wrong? Are you breaking any of the Ten Commandments? Pretty much. So you're lying and stealing? Maybe. I'm, I, I've lied before. And have you stolen? Yep. Have you used God's name in vain? No. So you have. Have you had sex before marriage? Yep. Have you looked with lust? Jesus said if you look with lust, you commit adultery in your heart. Did you know that? For sure I did that. So, have you ever used God's name in vain? I have, but... Do you know what you're doing? Not in a very long time. Do you know what you're doing when you do that? Using his name in vain. As a cuss word. Instead of a filth word to express disgust. Would you use your mother's name as a cuss word? No. Because you dishonor her, and when you use God's name as a cuss word, you dishonor him. It's called blasphemy, and it's punishable by death in the Old Testament. You know, you said it was in the past, you didn't do it for a long time. Time doesn't forgive sin. Everything you did was in the past. United States extradited a Nazi war criminal after 37 years. They didn't say, oh, it was in the past, let's forget it. No, it, it clings to us. Now, sin clings to us, even though it was a long time ago. Now, Jesus said, if you look at a woman and lust for her, you commit adultery with her in your heart. Have you ever looked at a woman with lust? Yep. Have you had sex before marriage? Yep. Have you ever hated someone? Yep. The Bible says if you hate your brother, you're a murderer. So I'm not judging you, but here's a summation of what you just said. You've told me you're a lying, thieving, blasphemous, fornicating, adulterer, and murderer at heart. So here's the big question. If God judges you by the Ten Commandments on Judgment Day, you're going to be innocent or guilty? Uh, I'm going to be guilty. Heaven or hell? I think I'm going to heaven. Yeah, but what you think doesn't matter. It's what reality says that dictates. You know what I always think about? This is the thing about God, the creator. He has the option to change the rules whenever he feels fit. And I think he follows the heart. He knows what's in my heart. Well, he knows that you're a lying, thieving, blasphemous, fornicating, adult at heart. You're heading for hell, and the Bible makes it clear. All liars will have their part in the lake of fire. No thief will inherit the kingdom of God. The scripture makes it very clear. No adulterer. So you're in big trouble. You know what the Bible says? God's wrath abides upon you. Every time you sin, you store up his wrath. It's going to be revealed on the day of judgment. And well, I wouldn't lie to you. It's a fearful thing to fall into the hands of the living God. And one of the greatest sins humanity ever does is we make a God to suit ourselves. We think, I think God is like this, and we shape a God to suit ourselves. 
It's called idolatry, and the Bible says idolaters will not inherit the kingdom of God. You want to be next? Okay. No, hang on, wait till I finish him. Give me about two minutes, three minutes. Thanks. Go to heaven or hell. I don't know. You don't know either, because nobody came back and told us where he's going. Yeah, the Bible says all liars will have their part in the lake of fire. No thief, no blasphemer, no fornicator. How we know that they went there unless they came back and told us? Oh, we have God's word on it. You have God's promise. If you die in your sins, he's going to give you justice, and that's a fearful thing. And you may not be concerned about it, but I am deeply concerned. I care about you. I don't want you to end up in hell. That would be horrific. You seem like a nice guy, and I don't want you to end up in hell. Now tell me, what did God do for guilty sinners so they wouldn't have to go to hell? Any idea? He sent his son to die for us? Yeah. Do you understand the legal implications of that? No, not really. Well, the Ten Commandments are called the moral law. You and I broke the law. Mm-hmm. Jesus paid the fine. Well, he, act, he forgives everybody, so... Did you hear what I said? We broke the law. Jesus paid the fine. That's why he said it is finished when he was on the cross, just before he died. In other words, the debt has been paid. Mm-hmm. Well, if you're in court and someone pays the fine... The judge can let you go. He can say, well, stack of speed and fines here, but someone's paid him. Even though you're guilty, you're out of here. And he does that which is just and legal. Well, God can legally dismiss your case, forgive your sins, let you live forever, all because of what Jesus did on the cross. The Bible says, Christ is one suffered for sins, the just for the unjust, that he might bring us to God. Then he rose from the dead, defeated death, and if you'll repent and trust in Christ, God will forgive every sin you've ever committed. He'll give you a new heart that loves righteousness. So you love that which is right instead of that which is wrong. Exactly why I said I'm going to heaven, because I already know this. You know it, but you haven't put it into practice because you still think you're a good person. So please, please think about what we talked about. Think about, have I truly repented? Am I trusting in Christ? Am I feeding on his word? Am I living in holiness? Because these are fruits that issue from a genuine conversion. What you have to do is repent of your sins. Don't say I'm a Christian and keep fornicating and lying and stealing and blaspheming. That's playing the hypocrite. You don't fault anybody but yourself. Mm -hmm. No, truly repent and trust in Jesus like you trust a parachute. If you're on the edge of a plane 10,000 feet up and you're going to jump without a parachute, the best thing I could do for you would be to hang out the plane by your ankles for two seconds. You'd come back in and say, whoa, give me a parachute. Fear would do its work. Fear would be your friend and, and cause you to put on a parachute. What I've tried to do today is hang out eternity by your ankles just for a minute and say, Lee, if you die in your sins, it's a fearful thing to fall into the hands of the living God. The Bible says, how should we escape if we neglect so great a salvation? So please don't die in your sins. Repent and trust in Jesus. And our churches are full of false converts that name the name of Christ but don't depart from sin. They hold on to their sins. So don't be deceived by your own sins. Truly repent, trust in Christ. Does this make sense? Makes a lot of sense. Tell me, is there an afterlife? I believe so. I don't believe it's what they're telling us, but it's something other than this. This didn't come from nothing. But the whole heaven and hell, the whole Bible and all that, that's, I don't believe that's exactly what it is. Have you read the Bible? I read a portion of it. It's about contradictions. Can you give me a contradiction and see if I can fix it for you? Um, a contradiction? Yeah. Okay. So, Cain and Abel, prime example. They were the first two kids, correct? He kills his brother, he gets banished, and goes and finds a, finds a wife. Yeah. And creates a family. How, if they're the first two people? God commanded Adam and Eve to be fruitful and multiply. He wasn't telling them to do math. He was saying to have sex. So Adam and Eve bred like rabbits. They had stacks of kids. So many, there was another city. Are you married? No, I'm not. I don't when, marriage. When, when you do get married, if you do get married, you'll marry a distant sister in the human family. We all do. We're brothers and sisters. That's what I'm saying. So you're basically saying we all came from incest. Yeah, if you want to call it incest, but God didn't. I'm not calling it. That's what it is. Well, it's not. If there's no law, there's no transgression. You don't break a law if the law doesn't exist. And there was no law of incest back in those days. No artifacts found from the Bible yet. Yes, there have. No, there haven't. Yes. In recent years, a series of extraordinary finds has been made in the Holy Land. These astonishing discoveries are linked to some of the most famous events in the Bible. 
This is something that biblical scholars have been waiting for, have been dreaming of for many years. Here is a proof. We can touch it, we can, we can smell it, we can go see it. This is where we came from. Where was Axon right? So you believe that he got two of every animal with no modern technology on, on, on one boat and they just sat there and sang songs until the storm was over? All dogs come from the canine kind. There's lots of different species. I get that, but yeah. so, it's only kind. Species? No, kinds. Okay, kinds, species, whatever you want to call them. A lot of them eat each other, so you think they was all on one boat? They were separated. Yeah, <laughs> and it wasn't okay, so a boat. Get them? It wasn't a boat, okay, it was a great okay, ship. So how did he get them? Because this species lives on this side of the planet. This species is on this side of the planet with this different climate, and they need this different climate to survive, but you're telling me they all survived on the boat? There was no oceans, okay? It hadn't rained and filled I the know, earth with how water. How did he get to this side of the earth and that side of the earth? Because God to. handled the whole thing. God can do anything. Yeah, that's God, what, nothing that's is impossible. What with God, nothing's impossible. See, I, I believe in all the miracles of the Bible, every single one. That's crazy, because no you never trouble. see no, no, no proof of any of it. Look, you're a miracle. Yeah, if you want to put it that way, but you've never seen any proof. It's just blind faith. No, it's not. Yeah, it is. I've had great proof. What? Show me the proof. If a little kid's looking at a heater and he believes the heater's hot, he's just got an intellectual belief. But if he touches the heater, he now moves out of belief into the realm of personal experience. He knows the heater's hot because he touched it. Well, God touched my life 46 years ago, transformed me. I moved out of the realm of belief into the realm of experience. But let me go back to something important. Let me explain something here that's vital if we want to reach people for Christ. If you watch our videos regularly, this will make what I do make sense. Romans 8 verse 7 says, The carnal mind is enmity against God. It is not subject to the law of God, neither indeed can be. The carnal, natural mind of man is in a place of hostility towards God. This is obvious when you hear people blaspheme the name of the God that gave them life. There's a state of hostility, and when you address that carnal mind with apologetics, Noah's Ark, artifacts, hypocrites in the church, when you stay in the realm of apologetics, you are addressing the carnal mind, that place of enmity. Now, I believe in apologetics. I've got a Bible called the Evidence Bible that is packed full of apologetics. I use apologetics, but I see them as bait and not the hook. When you go fishing, all you do is disguise the hook with a bait. And so I bait the intellect with apologetics, but I always move to the hook of God's law. So if you want to reach someone for the gospel, don't stay in the realm of the carnal mind. You've got to go to the area of harmony and not enmity. So where is that area of harmony? Well, Romans 2 verse 14 and 15 tells us, the carnal mind is enmity against God, but God has given us the conscience to address. This is what Jesus addressed when he spoke to the rich young ruler. This is what Paul addressed in Romans chapter 2 when he said, You who say you shall not steal, do you steal? You who say you shall not commit adultery, do you commit adultery? The Bible says the conscience is the work of the law written upon the heart. Romans 2.15 says, Which show the work of the law written upon the heart, the conscience bearing witness, the thoughts of me while accusing or else excusing one another. So the work of the law, the semblance of the law, the echo of the law is written upon the heart of every unsaved person. Conscience means with knowledge. So everyone affirms the truth of the commandments when you address the conscience, that impartial judge on the court of the mind. So this is where you're going to see a deliberate swing from the carnal mind to addressing the conscience. Let me go back to something important. Do you think you're a good person? Do I think I'm a good person? Yeah, I'll say I would. I mean, okay, I'm going to put that to the what's test. Your definition of good is good is the Ten Commandments. How many lies do you think you've told in your life? I have no idea. Quite a lot. Every yeah, a lot. Probably. So what do you? Well, yeah. So what do you yeah, call someone? You. Yeah, so what do you call someone who tells lies? Call him a liar. Have you ever stolen something? Yeah, we all stole something. What do you call someone who steals things? You call him a thief. Okay. Have you ever used God's name in vain? Yep. It's called blasphemy when you use God's name as a cuss word. Very serious. Would you use your mother's name as a cuss word? No, I wouldn't. But but why would you be condemned to hell for using his name as a cuss word if he created you knowing you're going to make mistakes? And that's the whole reason he sacrificed his son 
for your mistakes. So you've used God's name in vain. Jesus said, if you look at a woman and lust for her, you commit adultery with her in your heart. Have you ever looked at a woman with lust? Every day. You had sex before marriage? Every day. Have you hated somebody? That's a strong word, but yes, I have. The Bible says, he who hates his brother is a murderer. So hang on with this. I'm not, gonna, I'm not judging you, but you've just told me you're a lying, thieving, fornicating, blasphemous, yeah. adulterer, and a murderer at heart. Right. If God judges you by the Ten Commandments, well, we're going to hell. Yeah, well, you it are. doesn't sound like a forgiving, loving God. It certainly doesn't. It sounds like a just and holy God, as the Bible That's says just. he is. Viral, you may not realize yeah, this, but, but I love you, I care about you, yeah. and it horrifies me of the thought you're heading for hell, for God giving you justice on Judgment Day. I want you to be saved. I want you to end up in heaven, not hell. Now tell me, you seem to have some knowledge. What did God do for guilty sinners so they wouldn't have to end up in hell? I mean, he sacrificed his son. Yeah, the Ten Commandments are called the moral law. You and I broke the law. Jesus paid the fine. That's what happened on that, that cross. That doesn't make sense to me because... Well, on, well in a minute, okay. if you just listen. All right. You and I broke the law. Jesus paid the fine. That's why he said, it is finished just before he died. Viral, if you're in court and you've got a stack of speeding fines and someone pays the fines, the judge can let you go. He can say, viral, you've got a stack of speeding fines here, you're guilty, but someone's paid these fines, you're out of here. And he can do that which is legal and just. Well, God can legally dismiss your case, forgive your sins, let you live forever legally because of what Jesus did on the cross through his death and resurrection. He paid the fine so you could live forever. What you, that. yeah, and what you have to do, I know that's why I'm talking because to you. You, gotta repeat. you still, if, if he did that, I shouldn't have to repent for nothing I did because he already paid the ultimate price. Yeah, well, let me just explain it. The Bible says if you repent, that is, don't hang on to your sins, don't play the hypocrite and say, I'm a Christian and lie and steal and blaspheme and lust. If you truly repent, let go of your sins and trust in Christ like you trust a parachute. God will grant you forgiveness of sins and everlasting life as a free gift. That's the promise of the Bible, and it'll make sense to you if you acknowledge your sins. I mean, if, if you told me someone's paid your fine and I, I says, I haven't broken the law, the fine paying is just ridiculous. But if I say I've broken the law and you say someone's paid your fine, then it'll make sense. So if you'll acknowledge your sins, listen to your conscience, and say, boy, I've sinned against God. I didn't think sin was serious, but God certainly does. He gives the death sentence. Then the gospel will make sense to you. Viral, I'm not asking you to believe the Bible. There's a lot of stories in there that are hard to swallow. I mean, Jonah and the whale's hard to swallow. Noah and the ark's hard to swallow. But I'm not, I don't want you to believe those. I don't want to put the cart before the horse. I just want you to believe the gospel. And if you put the horse before the cart, believe the gospel, then you'll believe the Bible because it's God's instruction book. He'll open the eyes of your understanding the moment you're born again. So please just consider the gospel. Think about your own sins. Think about the secret ones that you thought that no one has seen but God has seen. Think about what Christ did on the cross. Think about your soul and how valuable your life is. Religion is like more of a tool of control. So they use the fear factor of hell to control people saying if you don't follow these rules you're gonna go to hell. Meanwhile they breaking all the rules, making all the money and basically controlling the world. Well, God's going to get him. That's hypocrisy. God yeah, will get him on a judgment that's day. That's what I'm saying. That's a, you know, the meek shall inherit the earth. But meanwhile, y'all going to struggle, but we're going to live good now. But don't worry, we're going to be punished in the afterlife that we have no proof of. See, I got a problem with that. Well, your proof is your death. Death shows you that God is serious about sin. So will you please think about this? Think about my earnestness and how I care about you. Man, I don't want your money. I must enjoy the church. I'm saying, please. If you don't know when you're going to die, it could be tonight, it could be tomorrow, and this is your eternity. So, would you please think about what we talked about? I, I'm a okay, okay. I will agree to think about it if you agree to think about what I talked about. I certainly will. Hey, thanks for talking to me. Hey. Well, thank you for talking to me. I really appreciate it. You going to think about what we talked about? Sure am. Do you hear what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. You going to think about this? For sure. You got a Bible at home? A couple of them. Lee, thanks for listening to me. Thanks for thanks for not getting mad no because God sent you to talk to me real quick.